we're going to talk about these four groups here. The oldest ones are your patients, your typical patients, the matures. The baby boomers are typically your business owners, most of you in this room. Generation X is the next generation of business owner and the influencers of the parents. And the millennials will be the influencers of the baby boomers. The millennials are the boomers' kids. And those baby boomers are just now getting into retirement years. And you would think they're a ready market or, or, or the symptoms are ready for the baby boomers to begin to use your products or, or your services and the products there. And we'll talk about how the baby boomers have this attitude of forever young. And we've got to treat the baby boomers as forever young. And there are all sorts of tricks to this. We'll get through this in a moment. Okay. Let's go macro to micro. We're going to go up level to, I want you to do and say the following things. So we're going to go macro here. What seems to matter for the senior members of our society, the matures and the baby boomers, what seems to matter is your history. Notice the arrow pointing to the right. It means your background. And we'll, we'll, we'll alternate this when we go into the Xers and the millennials. But what they're interested in is your history, your name recognition, your tenure in the marketplace, and your historical and perceived quality. How long you've been around, where you've come from. Your wall of fame, baby boomers and matures, is important to the other baby boomers and matures that you've seen. Your history matters. You have a baby boomer in front of you, a mature in front of you. I've been doing it for this year, I, these many years. I was educated this way. I was mentored by this individual. I've been a member of this community for X many years, whatever it may be. The history is very important. And the better you can articulate that, the more you build confidence in that patient, in that customer, in the influencer who's also a baby boomer or mature. It matters where you come from, very important. You'll see this change. When we get into the Xers and the millennials, it looks different. They don't care as much about where you've come from. They want you to talk about them, the individual, <laughs> the ego, how things will affect their lives and make them distinct, how you'll impact their future and how they're different. Let me tell you about you and how things will change versus let me tell you about me and where my practice or my business has come from. Now, it doesn't mean these messages conflict. If I go to the mature patient and say, let me tell you how this is going to impact you in your future, they're listen to that. But if you want them to build confidence with you, talk about where you've come from. Similarly, if, I go, if you go to the X or the millennial and they see you say, look, here's my diploma, here are my degrees, here's my designations. Notice in my lobby, I've got Lucite with my name on it all over the place. They're looking at you saying, that's kind of dated. Are you up to date? Talk to me about me and what you're going to do for me. So in the interesting thing I find is if you're normal, your website, your material, your brochures are often focused on history. This is where we've come from. And considering that mature customer base, considering that baby boomer mature customer base, that works fine. But as you begin to think about the influencers who are helping with the decision, you've got to talk about them and their future and how you'll change this, how you'll change it. Let's so begin to think about this. As we this is through. who we're going to talk about. And I'm going to touch some highlights, some characteristics of each. That we have the matures, very important place in the marketplace right now. But we're going to focus on the boomers, the Xers, Generation X, and the millennials. They are the majority of the workforce. They're the majority of the marketplace, which is our focus here. Inside this content, and it'll be clear as we go along, are some recruiting ideas. You need to staff up. We heard that over and over again. I'm going to give you some tools, some tips on how to connect with that next generation of excellent agents. So let me see. Let me uh, let's start at the bottom. It's important I know who's in the room. Who are our millennial generations in the room? Let me see the show of hands here, please. OK, we have a pretty good bit. I was told we'd ex uh, there would be a good bit. Thank you very much. You represent about 80 million people in our society. You in this room are the very tip top of an enormous iceberg, and you will have influence in this market for a long time to come. You're very important to everyone. Therefore, we're going to study you towards the tail end in a little bit more depth, and we're going to call you today specimens. You're our specimen generation, OK? Who are my Generation Xers based on these numbers here? This is my peer group. Keep your hands up. Everyone look around. These are some of the most cynical, unpleasant, unhappy, and unlikable people you'll ever find. 
We are a difficult customer. We don't buy, we stalk. In UXers, you know what I'm talking about. We stalk wherever we place our money. It could be a $30 toaster. We go online and we begin to hunt toasters online. We go and evaluate toasters. We create spreadsheets with toaster features on them and monitor the toaster features. We go onto the social media and type in, does anyone have a toaster recommendation for me? And we start getting feedback on toaster recommendations. And then the last step is we call our friends. Can you give me a referral on your toaster? I had some toaster at your house a couple years ago and really liked it. Can you vouch for the toaster? We are an extraordinary difficult customer, a difficult client. We stalk our purchases. And the more significant the purchase, the more we stalk. We are the most loyal. Due to the amount of work we do, when we find something we like, we stay very close to it. But one of the tricks of my generation, we'll get into that in a little bit, our relationships with our purchases have likely begun prior to you showing up. In other words, we do the research, we hear about it, we think it's for us, we do the research, and our relationship has begun. Let me give you an example outside of your market, but you'll understand. Mercedes-Benz knows that Generation X spends 16 hours researching cars, not just their cars, but cars prior to a purchase. 16 hours before they ever show up on the lot, which means that the Xer has begun the relationship with the product well before that salesman has ever shaken his hand or her hand. It's beginning a long time. Therefore, and that has implications as we go along. Let's see the hands of the baby boomers. They're the last group out there. All right, that's what I figured. Now, the tail end of the baby boomer, 59 to 64, born in the years 1959 to 1964. Hold your hand up and keep them up. Everyone look around. These tend to be some of the most mixed up and disturbed people you'll ever find. <laughs> These are weird people. We're not supposed to say that, but they are. They're the tail end. Now, those of you that raised your hand, you're the tail end of the baby boomer. You're the most, you're the largest section of the baby boom, and uh, you're a, kind of a unique subsection of that. I'm not a baby boomer. I don't feel like a baby boomer. That's what you're saying. For everyone who didn't raise their hand, and we could go on forever, everyone who didn't raise their hand and saw whose hand was up, this is what's important to know. More crime is committed by people born between the years 1959 to 1964 than any other group out there. That's why we want them to raise their hand first. We want to know who they are. They will check out of this swanky hotel and have picked their room clean, and they know what I'm talking about. I don't need soap. I've got soap at home. Heck, I shop at Costco. I got tons of soap. But I'm taking the soap. And they just sweep the counter off. I'm not exactly sure if this remote control will work at home, but I'm going to give it a try. And at the very least, I'm going to get some AA batteries out of the deal. Let's put that in the bag, too. You know who you are. All right. It's kind of a generalization. But if you think about everyone you don't like, they're all Generation Xers. I have no doubt about that. A suspicious group, a nomad group is what they're called as an archetype, as whatever it may be. They tend to want to engage loosely. That leads to the challenge of the Generation X manager, which I see coming out in the workplace. We as managers, Generation Xers, have likely done well in our job by going away and doing it well. And we have been rewarded for that. You do such a great job. You need such little interaction. Whatever it may be, as a result, you're getting what's next, the promotion. You now manage this team. And if you're a typical Generation X manager, what you do by manage your team is what I said earlier. Go do it. Good luck. You know your goals. You know the timelines. You know what you need. Just take off. I'm not going to bother you at all. I have the office over here. You can find me on the phone. You can Skype me, whatever. And if you don't need me, you won't hear from me. I think that's great. That's the way I'd want it to be. That's the way you're going to want it to be. Sounds good. I'll talk to you a year or so. That sounds good. <laughs> the problem is, my Generation Xers, listen to me. The baby boomers who we may manage and the millennials who we also may manage like people. <laughs> they like FaceTime and consensus building and they like to get together, whether it's in person or on the telephone or some sort of chat environment. They need uh, reinforcement. 
They need to collect and to talk and to get on the same page and all this kind of stuff. We generally don't need that too much. And what happens is that, now here's the caution, if we manage and lead people, Generation Xers, the way we want to be managed and led, we will find a mutiny going on in our baby boomer and millennial people, teammates who work for us. They will say, I don't know where the boss is coming from. I never hear from him or her. I don't feel like we're connected in a meaningful way. And you want to say, listen, we work together. I got all the friends I need. We work together. Let's not overdo this. But it is a threat. It is a threat. It is a two-step process, Generation Xers, to become engaged in your team. Step number one, you call them, see them, stop them in the hall, and say, how you doing? Step one. Step two, you wait for the answer. It's a two-part process. For whatever reason, my Generation X peers and I carry more paper through the workplace than other groups. Why? So you can walk down the hall like this. I don't have to talk to people if it appears that I'm reading. This is great. I've always got something in front of me here. So, and I'll give you one, one, one more little thing before I get into the to-dos on this. What, this comes to me from a hospital system in California. We're in California, a hospital system here. The nurse manager said she would go into the hall. This is the nurse manager with one of the Kaiser hospitals. Go down the hall, full of baby boomers and millennials. They come out, they stream out of the doors to say hello. And they reconnect and they jib jab and they, how you doing? How's everything been since yesterday? Everything's fine since yesterday. What's going on? Jibber jab, uh, uh, less than a minute and they disperse. The same nurse manager comes down the hall full of generation Xers and the Xers peer out of the doors. Why are you here? Coming to check on you, I'm rounding. It's important for morale. No, it's really not that you, uh, that you do this type of stuff. The same behaviors. The boomers and millennials call FaceTime and consensus building the very same behaviors the Generation Xers call micromanagement. Same behaviors. Xers, don't do it anymore. Get out and meet your people. Here we go. Key point number three. In so many parts of our lives today, we work hard to make it easier on others. That's what service is called. But what I'm talking about is inside your workplace. But making it easier often doesn't make it better. We think that we're doing people favors by removing struggle from their lives. Yet it is conquering the struggles that gives meaning and are the seeds of happiness. Don't remove the struggles. Don't remove the struggles. It's the helicopter mom. It's the helicopter dad. And they're beginning to show up in the workplace. You're saying it's just easier for me to do it versus teaching people how to do it. And one of the things people like me who study this type of thing are seeing is a decline in happiness or a vain search in happiness for the un from the under 45-year-old crowd. I'm not happy. I'm looking for a good job that makes me happy. And by removing the struggle from people's lives, your children's lives, your teammates' lives, whatever it may be, we, we, we don't give them the tools that make, that make happiness possible. There's no doubt that the super mom and the super dad and the helicopter mom and the helicopter dad who have removed the struggles from their children's lives are creating people in the workplace who are having a hard time finding a job that makes them happy. Happiness. They are told so I want you out. to start to teach. I want you to start to offer help. I want you to offer guidance. I want you to mentor. That's a big word and I see you offer a big program like that. But don't remove the struggles. Achieving, overcoming the uh, struggles, achieving the end is a great source and in, in, in tool to happiness. So your question, where might you have removed the struggle for your team? My research suggests that the lack of struggles and the absence of a sense of achievement is also a cause for poor engagement. We're looking for engaged people. This is a Western affluence employee. phenomenon, and it impacts the way your people think, the way they think about you, their job, and what engagement means to them. Today, the definition of success held by youth often differs from the definition held by senior generations. The apprentice to master model is still the way people learn their jobs. And that is likely the way most of you have learned your job. However, in affluent times, we see that youth enter the workplace and begin to define success differently than their boss. Pay this, but they'll pay it later. 
people are growing up later, it will happen later. People pay the highest amount of life insurance when they enter their, their middle age, their primary earning years, and they begin having children. They will still buy this stuff, but they will be buying it later. Your customers will be getting older, but entering life stages that happened in, to you much younger. Does that make sense? Your customers will be much older, but entering life stages that you experienced much younger. Another one, mortgage debt. People carry the highest amount of mortgage debt between the ages of 45 and 54. They will still do that, but this generation is buying homes later and they will be experiencing Here's your quick hit tactic later. for the millennials. And this one's a little bit more lengthy, so I'm gonna go through it a little slowly. They will be buying homes soon, if not already. So I want you to essentially capitalize on this group mentality. So the first step is find one. Find a, mon a millennial. They need to be well connected, lots of friends, respected, not your kid. Probably be someone else's, that's my hunch. So find one. Invite them to invite their friends to lunch. On you, that you're going to teach them how to shop for a home when they're ready. They need to be thinking about this right now. The market's right. You're gonna educate them for free, you're gonna feed them lunch. I want you to create a document that asks each person to evaluate themselves. How they may be different for than their peers, and lots of fill in the bank, easy to fill out. What makes them unique? Step four. Ask them, then, and then ask them what these differences may look like in the house they want to buy. All right, you're special, tell me how it is. What does this mean to the home you want to buy? Step five, then how much could they afford to pay without worrying about money all the time? Got to enjoy life, right? Dude. Six, then your list of for your own enjoyment and eventual resale, the 10 things every house you buy should have. Instructions on how to quickly check that the house has it. You're teaching them, you're gathering, you're benefiting from their, their instinct to flock, and you're teaching them. And seven, take every question you can take. Put a plus a list of the best websites you know for home buyers and mortgages. You're gonna make them experts, they wanted and they will come to you. children to be different, when and ready, feel different, and work on ego and self-esteem. Baby boomers in this room, do you ever remember your parents focusing on your ego or your self-esteem? <laughs> Probably not. Baby boomers in this room, were you ever told that you were special and unique and different from everyone else? Probably not. If you ever heard something like that, it sounded something like this. What do you think, you're special or something? <laughs> so it was actually an accusation to stand out. To be different was an accusation. And then today, let's go to the slides. Then today, we begin to see things like this. These are my daughter's ribbons from the swim meet this past summer. We have 8th, 10th, 7th, 9th, 8th, 7th, 5th, 11th, 10th, and another 11th place ribbon. <laughs> that's, a, that's a talented child, isn't it? I, I do not make this up. She got an 11th place ribbon in a six-lane pool.